Hello and welcome everybody. This is Stephanie Gunning and we're here for an interview with author Lucy Quigley, author of You Are Worthy. We worked together on this book uh, about a year ago uh, when Lucy was one year into recovery from an eating disorder. And uh, Lucy is an NYU college student in the nutrition department. She's 20 years old now. Uh, she is a great friend of mine. I loved editing her book and I love uh, the vibrancy of her spirit and how she wants to bring a positive message to the world. And uh, so how are you doing today, Lucy? <laughs> Hi, Stephanie. Um, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much for saying that. Um, same for you. I wouldn't have been able to really realize I could actually do this if it weren't for your mentorship and help. So, um, yeah, you changed so much for me. My pleasure. You know, um, a lot of people want to write, but most people don't get started writing as early in life as you did. And as I recall, wasn't it when you were in treat when you began treatment for your eating disorder that you your counselor or so, uh, some mentor suggested to you that you begin to journal? What was what was the origin of the writing itself? Um, yeah, actually, I think now that yeah, I think I started actually journaling um, on my own before I went into treatment and before I sought help. Um, it was something that really let me express myself in a safe way. And I felt I could really just write my thoughts. And then after I was writing and writing more and more and, um, you know, realizing I need professional help and I need to work through this, um, I sort of thought to myself, I could make this writing into something actually really beautiful. And I could um, try to share my story in a way that would hopefully resonate with people that know me, but also, um, reach others and help people and I guess it turned into something that was for me but then allowed me to share myself and yeah. So I think it's very courageous to write your story and tell the truth particularly when it's very fresh mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that we've heard that many voices of people who are in the midst of uh, learning how to manage their thinking and their behavior in the way that you were doing. Can you tell us a, a little bit about what the book actually is? Yeah, um, here's what it looks like. Um, Beautiful. You are yeah. worthy. <laughs> back. You are worthy. Um, it sort of starts off in the beginning, um, talking about me and uh, my story and how I've how I see myself, um, and then it goes into, I guess, sort of just what brought me into the eating disorder, um, and the, you know, some of the underlying issues, and going through the different phases of the different eating disorders. Um, you know, a lot of people think eating disorders are just one, or um, show up in only one way, but it's really common for the symptoms to transform and manifest in really different ways. So I broke the, I broke the book up into different sections um, on that and my story and my experiences through those different sections. And then I just sort of at the end talked more about, um, I think, hopeful things and um, like things you can do to get out of it. And um, I guess little things that have really been game changers for me in the terms of my recovery. Um, yeah. So, so let's talk in, uh, in general terms about this. I understand that a, a, a really large number of college students have eating disorders that may be unrecognized. What is the statistic on the number of college students with an eating disorder? Um, college students, you know, it's 20% is what I've heard, uh, but from what I've experienced and from what I know, it's almost every girl I know that struggles with it to an extent, to different varying degrees, of course, but, um, So this means overeating, anorexia, uh, binging and purging, yeah. uh, exercising too much to try to like burn off the calories you ate what mm. what are are there other behaviors that I'm missing no I think you know that's sort of it um and 
it's just, it's a result of really just a lot of the pressure. I think um, this generation is feeling and the standards of beauty we're comparing ourselves to. And it's just, it's, uh, my therapist actually was, we were talking and um, she's told me that it's an epidemic for this generation. And um, it is. And the selfie generation, right? I mean, everybody is, everybody's on yeah. camera. A camera's yeah. always on somewhere. Uh, yeah. you, you see celebrities everywhere and they're all like, they look like skeletons most of the time. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. And um, this book, I think, has given me a chance to have more of a voice in this, in this battle of yeah. um, that's not going away overnight. But if I can do anything or if I can help change one person's perspective or if I can, you know, make a crack at trying to do something, I'm going to do everything in my power because um, the pain of an eating disorder is something that no one should have to feel. So, um, right. Yeah. So, so um, let's just go back to the statistics for a minute. Yeah. I, I, I just think that this is so important for people to realize. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's mild to severe and at the most severe, it's fatal, right? I yeah. mean, p people die of, eat, of anorexia and, yeah. and malnutrition. Yeah, um, anorexia out of all the mental disorders actually has the highest mortality rate. And uh, that's what's so dangerous about eating disorders is, you know, they're a medical issue, they're a psychological issue, and they're detrimental to the quality of living life. Um, so because it's just, it's really, you need, so yeah. Even, even a mild one is going to mess with your body chemistry yeah. which is going to affect how your brain functions yeah and, you know and, so yeah. thinking and feeling good are much harder when you're malnourished exactly and while you're malnourished if you continue to be malnourished the thoughts of the eating disorder keep growing stronger and stronger because you're farther and farther from you know who you're really supposed to be. Um, so it's a vicious cycle and it's also um, you really can't reckon it's really hard to recognize and one of my other big missions is to change the way that people see eating disorders because you can never tell by looking at someone whether they're starving themselves or not. And someone could be overweight, but internally their body is malnourished and in starvation. And um, people really need to start realizing that you can't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> That's right. And you, and you don't know where somebody is in the cycle either. I mean, they could have already lost 200 pounds and now you're looking at a thin person and they're thinking of themselves as a fat person or 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 the other way around you know um because people's internal images are messed up so 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 this is a medical issue which is really an important thing to say how many of the people with eating disorders are getting treatment that they need um, I've read only that 10% are, um, I think it's hard to know for certain, but um, it's something that goes unrecognized and often goes untreated. And the earlier you get help and the earlier you really crack this out, like the better and better your chances are of having a full recovery. And if you can just realize that you deserve help and you deserve treatment and there's way more to living than living in the way you are, it's you just you need to make the choice to be better because you can we all can it's it's just it takes such, hard work. A, such an important message so so describe what it feels like to be caught up in those thoughts and that pattern um is it self-criticism what are you hearing in your head all day long um yeah it's a really dark place to be it's not a good place to be um it's you know it's sort of like every day every second of the day every um part of your day has to revolve around the eating disorder whether uh if you're you know restricting and starving yourself it's like thinking about you know alloc allocating different portions of your day as to if i have you know this slice of chicken for dinner and then i'm gonna work out before dinner and then oh, someone asked me to go to lunch, but I can't because I'm like, I need to lose this weight. And um, it's a really, it really isolates you and prevents you from actually living. And it's um, a really dark place to be. And you, you just, you sit back at the end of the day and you're like, I'm alone. I 
have nothing going for me, then your mind starts racing, racing, racing. And um, is and there I'm, embarrassment and shame? Are you hiding that you're doing this? Yes, that's it's a really uh, disorder that's really easy to hide. Mm -hmm. um, and it's you it's so much shame and so much shame around the binging and the starvation and the binging and then the cycle. I think like that's one of the and the binging is the most painful part of it. That's what people um, always want to, th that's the symptom everyone wants to get rid of first because it's the most painful. Um, and there's so much shame and embarrassment behind it. But um, I think the more we talk about it and the more um, people come forward with their stories and what they're going for, the closer we all will be to healing. And that's what matters. You taught me a great term that I was not, I, I mean, it made perfect sense to me when I heard it, which was the term disordered thinking. Mm. And I've noticed something about my own eating patterns uh, since meeting you and working with you on your book. Oh, man. Is that there, no, but I mean, and I think that a lot of people have this. There, there are times, and it, it's not just, for me, I sometimes overwork. And that's almost like a, an addictive cycle for me. It's, it's a little bit, when I get over, when I'm working too hard and I love my job, you know, mm -hmm. I get tired and then I want to eat. And then, you know, and I want to watch TV or, yeah, it's yeah. a release. It's, and yeah. it's almost like a pleasure center in my brain goes on. But I've noticed since paying attention to it that uh, for hours ahead, I start fantasizing about a particular flavor or texture or something. And then I'm like obsessed and it starts to like take me over and it's a very uncomfortable feeling. So um, I've actually started dealing with it by just saying, hey, if I want that, I can have it. <laughs> That's and I just try to disrupt it right at the beginning by just giving, you know, and, it, and it's odd, but by having permission, I feel like, I, I can stop thinking, you know, in that way. And uh, yes, yes. So is so. What are some of the um, other than journaling? What are some of the other things that you would advise? Uh, like, if there's the top five things you would advise another woman or a male, a college age person who thinks that they have some kind of eating issue to do. Okay. Um, Number one, I think the first thing you should do is tell someone um, and tell someone you're struggling um, because people will be there for you in ways that you probably don't think you deserve. People will listen to you and um, by t you have to be really brave to do it though and you have to be really vulnerable and really strong to put yourself out there but you have to tell someone even if it's a friend. Um, it, it'll get you out of your head in the moment and it also um, you know, you realize that this isn't something you're going to go through on your own because it's not, um, you don't have to. Um, I think the second thing would be after you tell someone it's really important to find a treatment plan that works for you. Um, and you know, I, everyone's so different and everyone's, uh, level of severity and needs are different, but I think having some form of actual treatment is really gonna set you apart in your healing and recovery and for the long run. Um, and it's, I like, I really encourage anyone to look into it, whether it's starting with going to a school counselor or, or like doing something, but you need to tell your story and you deserve to tell your story. Um, and you'll realize that everyone has a story and that you're not not normal for going through this. So there, there are some resources that are on your website. Your website is your mm -hmm. name, lucyquigley.com. And um, so, so you could call one of those hotline numbers that are there, right? Yeah, yep. I, and then they can direct you. Uh, can you can you just say one of those numbers right now if you know it offhand? Um, I don't know it off the top of my head. I can look it up. It's um, like the National Eating Disorders Treatment Center. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just a second. Okay. I I um I love the idea of uh, telling someone to, it should be a trusted person, right? I mean, it could be a professional, but yes. it could be a friend or a family member, but mm -hmm. somebody who's not going to judge you or. Yeah. shame you or criticize you right I mean, yeah yeah it, it should really be someone you feel safe with and that you feel unconditionally loved by um 
because they will and it's really hard to realize that you're like worthy of love and like worthy of belonging but like you so are and you like the good and the bad every part of you is worthy of love and help and deserving of having your voice being heard um so just i i really encourage you to find the bravery and just advocate for yourself because you deserve it mm -hmm. that's what i would say um the eating disorder hotline is 1-800-931-2237 yeah, okay. if you're struggling yeah and uh, can you say that one more time yeah one eight hundred nine three one two two three seven great and those are people who who probably have battled their own issues and their peer i think they're probably peer counselors and and volunteers who are who are ready to talk to people about um what they need in the moment and yes. so that's two so wh wh what what else i mean uh, how do you how do you get through the day is there um, a daily yeah. strategy Okay, uh, the third thing, or uh, yeah, that's two. Um, for, <laughs> for a, you need to change your location um, and get out of your house or your own head. And uh, that's been the game changer for me in really, really depths of despair. Um, I can remember one time in particular, it, it was really bad. And um, I, I went to my grandmother's who lives in Connecticut, but I was, my dad took me and like, you need to, if you can't do that though, um, walk, go for a walk, find, go to a friend's house, leave your house, leave your room, leave the kitchen. Like you, you need to change your scenery. You need to do something. Um, and you need to break the cycle you're in and to do that changing where you are visually can be really helpful. Yeah. That's cool. So, so literally sort of like just, just whatever is triggering you in the space you're in. Yeah, you, have you to, know, and and you have to get rid you of your triggers. Yeah. That's, oh, that's so. So, what does what does that mean? Like getting rid of uh, pressures, foods. What what does that mean? Getting rid of yeah, triggers. Yeah. Um, all of the above. Um, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. If if you're in a binging and purging mode, and there's or binging, just binging. If there's some one food or one thing in particular that you're constantly craving and you have that urge, get it out of the house um, because that will leave the temptation and don't let yourself buy it. You just, you have to get it out and do something else to take your mind off of it. Yeah. Um, in terms of like deep rooted eating disorder triggers that are really hard to almost identify and come to peace with, you have to do what you can and do the work to get peace and learn how to cope with them. Um, this might not, make total sense. So I guess I'll give an example, like um, social media for me is something that's really detrimental and really triggering in many ways. And um, temporarily deleting your accounts is something that can really free up your mind and um, help you see outside of yourself. You have to learn how to identify what's contributing to your thoughts and patterns and um, yeah, work through it and find ways to cope with it. That's a pretty bold move for a lot of people to, to delete an account uh, yeah. or put it on hold or whatever. Um, yeah. But I can see, you know, if you're really talking about something that's taking so much energy and exactly. life force from you and so yeah. much space in your brain, you exactly. know, that's what you're talking about is getting back your life, right? Yeah. And uh, fulfillment, like having true nourishment from life instead of from... Yeah. Uh, this cycle so yes um and and you know on your blog you wrote you actually recently wrote a beautiful piece about friendship and you know can you talk a little bit about that uh how mm. you know how having relationships oh excuse me my phone is probably noise i'm just turning it down um <laughs> nobody says that <laughs> um yeah, can you talk a little about that? Yeah, so this actually goes really pretty deep into um, eating disorder recovery, but one of the keys is learning to reestablish yourself and the way you view yourself in the world. And um, for me, that's been a lot about friendship and realizing that I'm worthy of friendship and worthy of um, being part of something that's bigger than yourself. And, um, you know, the gift of friendship I'm learning is irreplaceable and 
it really changes everything. So it's really important though to just to seek it out and to find friends that you can be yourself with and people that accept you for who you are. Um, because it makes, for me, like having friends and having like fun things to look forward to and getting through the day, it, it's the difference between living and being alive. And it, you know, it's a game changer in terms of eating disorder recovery and um, realize that like, I would say to someone realize that you're so worthy of like being part of like different things and ha like what you have to say and the things you like, we're all so worthy, but we don't think we are, but um, friendship changes everything. It really does. I love, I love that idea that uh, being accepted as you are because you can kind of see reflected in a friend your okayness, right? Yeah. Um, sometimes we don't love ourselves enough, mm -hmm. but our friends can help us see ourselves through their eyes. And, uh, and also, I, you know, like I live alone, I, when I have a pet or plants, I literally feel better because I'm caring about something that's not me. And yes. that also, you know, so I also, sometimes I've had friends who've been very depressed or anxious and I've told them, go volunteer. Yep. You know, yep. Um, I, I became a, um, the director of community service in my residence hall and like it has changed so much. And yeah, it's something, something about knowing that you're contributing to something that's bigger than yourself and giving, giving yourself to others and other things. Um, it helps you realize you're worthy worthy and that you ha that you're empowered yeah. that you have some control of your you know fate <laughs> as yeah. it were right mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. that's one that's wonderful now what has been the most surprising thing to you uh, what have been the reactions of people to your book um there have been a few things um one particularly surprising thing um actually yesterday um <laughs> I was up really late and um, my brother texted me at like two in the morning and he was like, he's in Costa Rica right now on a gap year. And um, he met this other kid who's from Connecticut and um, their friend is struggling with an eating disorder. And my brother um, was helping them through it, talking it through and told them about me and my story. And they said, oh, wait, that's your sister? We had an assembly and they showed her book at our assembly. And oh, I was like, okay. <laughs> like, I don't know how, but um, yeah, I, it, that, that was a mind blower for me. Um, and the outpouring of love I think I've received from telling the story and from people I didn't expect. I, I, I thought it would be a lot of college kids that resonated with it, but um, I've gotten more emails, notes, messages, phone calls, I would say from mothers and um, older women actually who have been telling me that if they had a book like this or if they had someone like this who was their age while they were in college going through this, it would have given them a lot of hope and um, I've helped them and they said their daughters as a result. So it's just, you know, I never thought I, just by speaking your truth, it could really um, help change people's lives. but. I know I have in a small way at least, and I'm really proud of myself for that. And you should be proud of yourself. It's a big thing to you know, reach out and contribute so generously in order that other people can heal. Um, so college is very stressful. It's a transition from leaving home. Yeah. And uh, you're kind of isolated. You're in your dorm room, your little box somewhere all by yourself with your books all day long. Yeah. And um, so you kind of are in your own feedback loop and um, this is the way to get out of it. So what length of time does recovery take for most people? Three to seven years. Um, and if you don't get help, it can be a lifetime. Right. And um, you know, you see it, you see people walking down the street and you just know. Um, but you know, I'm proof of if you can, work on your issues and get help and open up, it, it'll change. And I'm here to tell you it has, and it does. And the life of the eating disorder is not going to be a reality, I promise. It, things will change. People just have to fight for it and realize that they're worthy. That's beautiful. I think I'm gonna let that be the last word because okay. so fight for it, you deserve it, you're worthy, mm -hmm. and it's gonna get better. 
Yeah. Beautiful. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Lucy. So everybody, that's lucyquigley.com. Uh, Quigley is Q-U-I-G-L-E-Y. And she has a blog there and resources and uh, links to get the book and to contact her and communicate with her. Now, remember, she is, a she is in college, so she's <laughs> working hard on getting her bachelor's degree. And so, you know, she will, you know, reply and communicate. But, you know, if she's not blogging, it's because she's in class. <laughs> so don't blame her for that. <laughs> but take care, everybody. I hope, that, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. It's a, it's a wonderful um, book. And thank you so much, Lucy. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah. I really appreciate it. You're welcome.